Good afternoon. Welcome to our service of worship. I trust and pray as we meet together that you'll be blessed and that God will be glorified. If any visitors are amongst us, I pray you feel especially welcome. I have a couple of things by way of announcements uh, to bring to your attention. Firstly, let me begin by thanking you for prayerfully and practically supporting the, uh, the Summer Bible Club, which ran uh, Monday to Friday of the week just gone. We had an average uh, 20 children each evening. Thank you to all of you who give of your time and talents to, to make that work. Those who fed us throughout the week on uh, each evening before the, the, uh, the work began, we were fed like kings. Uh, yeah, so thank you for that. And for those of you who assisted practically in any other way, and most of all, uh, for those who prayed for that, thank you for taking the time and for remembering the work of the Summer Bible Club before God in prayer. I was just bef- uh, one other thing that's come to me was given to me as a, uh, this morning or this afternoon was a, a note from uh, a uh, Beryl Boyd with regards to the Christian Aid collection, which it was four hundred and eighteen pounds was collected by for uh, yeah, Christian Aid here in Current Hall. So thank you for your generosity in supporting that very important work, and uh, yeah, I commend that work ongoing to you. Then, with regards to our the announcement sheet itself, uh, today Peter Rogers from Glen Hoy will speak briefly about his move overseas uh, to mission work. Uh, and to help support him financially, all loose collection will be given to him. So if you're able to, uh, please give generously. You'll notice on the announcement sheet uh, other summer Bible clubs uh, running uh, in the locality over the next uh, two months. Uh, there's one this week in Claharney, beginning from Monday through to Friday. So uh, can, I, can I ask you to prayerfully uh, support these, uh, these summer Bible clubs and indeed uh, in, encourage people uh, with young children to send their kids along to that to those summer bible clubs another item uh, i'd like to bring to your attention is the after tea service refreshments uh, as has been our custom of late it is planned we have a cup of tea after uh, with our tea or coffee and plus biscuit, biscuits etc after the sunday service during july and august so if you're able to provide refreshments after the service, please put your name on the sheet in the vestibule next to the date that suits you. You'll also notice the summer service times that from Sunday of next week throughout the month of July and August, the services will begin at the earlier time of 11.30 a.m. So uh, yeah, please remember that. Please take note of that from next week onwards. There are other announcements on there for your information uh, and for your consideration and prayerful support, and I commend them to you. We're now going to read from God's Word, and as we've been looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we find ourselves in chapter 1, beginning at verse 15 today. And if you have your Bibles with you, can I encourage you to open your Bibles at this passage, Ephesians chapter 1, where we'll begin reading from verse 15. If you're using a pew Bible, that reading can be found on page 1173. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. There in the Apostle Paul says, For this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, 
power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And we end our reading at verse 23 and give thanks to God for this reading from his truth. Knowledge is power. That's a phrase which many of you will be familiar with. The basic meaning of it is that having knowledge makes you influential. So in that sense, knowledge can give you authority over others in that you can tell them something they didn't know or how to do something they would otherwise be unable to do. Doctors, for example, have medical knowledge that the majority of us don't have. So when we are unwell, we go to a doctor in the hope that they can tell us what the problem is and how it can be cured. That is one aspect of the meaning of this phrase, but another one is that knowledge gives you ability. And it is this sense that is most applicable in the realm of Christianity. And what I mean by that is knowledge of the right kind <clears throat> can equip people who have trusted in Christ for their salvation to live faithful, fruitful lives of discipleship. This is something that the Apostle Paul knew and earnestly wanted his fellow believers to know. As I mentioned previously, when we began looking at Ephesians, the church there in Ephesus had been established by Paul in the midst of pagan idolatry. However, coming to faith in Christ and or coming to faith in Christ was one thing. How to live for him faithfully in such an environment was another. But being a faithful, fruitful follower, follower of Christ was not then and nor is it now simply a matter of trying to do your best to abide by the a list of do's and don'ts. That is because unless obedience to God is rooted in gratitude towards an adoration of our Lord and Saviour, then it becomes onerous and we can develop a sense of entitlement. In other words, we can begin to believe that our good living gains and maintains God's favour and it entitles us to salvation. Is that not the prevailing view amongst people today who profess to believe in God? Have you said to them, ah, yes, I believe in God, but they've not entrusted their lives to Christ, but yet they still believe that they will be forgiven? Good living is only the fruit of salvation. It is not the root of it. As I said, Paul established the church in Ephesus and some four or five years had passed since he had been with them in person. Since then the church had obviously grown both physically and spiritually and when news of this had reached him in Rome it brought joy to his heart causing him to thank God in his prayers for them. But Paul, ever the pastor, concerned for his brothers and sisters in Christ did not merely thank God for their example of faith and love. He, he also prayed that the Lord would continue to bless them with spiritual maturity. And we can see this in verses 16 to 23 of our reading, which tell us that he prayed they would know four different things, the first of which is knowing God the Father better, knowing God the Father better. Verse 17 says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And therein Paul reminds us of something that we would do well to remember, namely that we do not have the capacity in and of ourselves to know more about God. It's something which only the Holy Spirit can give us. Only he can open our eyes to the truth of Scripture, both with regards to our sin and our need of salvation through faith in Christ. And what it teaches us about God the Father. Therefore it is only by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that we can know God better. And the importance of this knowledge can easily be lost on us. 
But it is crucial to being a faithful, fruitful follower of Christ. That's because, as John Calvin put it, without knowledge of God, there is no knowledge of self. In other words, it is not until we learn about God's character and abilities that we can have an accurate picture of ourselves. What I mean by that is, without reference to God, we have no data point for what is good or bad, what is right and what is wrong. Therefore, we have no knowledge of our sin and need of salvation. In other words, without knowledge of God, we have no idea how flawed we really are. We are clueless in regards to that. But even when, by God's grace, through the Holy Spirit, we do become aware of our sin, when we humbly repent and seek salvation in Christ's name, even then we are prone to forget that we are natural-born sinners. Unless, that is, we continually remind ourselves by actively seeking with the Holy Spirit's help to know God better. So if we don't, we gradually lose sight of who God is and consequently our own depravity. And the outworking of that of this is that we start thinking less of God and more of ourselves, which results in us starting to decide what is right and what is wrong. It is sad, therefore, that many people who profess faith in Christ do not see the need for them to know God better. They view it as something they don't really need to do. When in reality, it is crucial to being a faithful, fruitful follower of Christ. Such people, therefore, don't have what is commonly known as a quiet time, wherein they spend a set time each day reading God's word and praying. And we all know that in order to get to know someone better, you have to spend time with them on a regular basis. Because without doing so, we will never know what makes them tick, as we would say. So why, if we profess faith in Christ, should we believe that having a quiet time is not a necessary part of our daily routine? Unfortunately, many such people also don't see the need to regularly attend public worship, to praise God to fellowship with other believers and to sit under the teaching of God's word. And as for attending a midweek Bible study where the studies are, the Bible is studied more in depth, well, they never go for that, go to that. Now I know there are varied reasons why people cannot always attend public worship or a midweek, but not all of them are valid. And that's because if our reason for not going is because we prefer doing something else, or we just can't be bothered, then it suggests that God is not the one we are really worshipping. That he is not Lord of our lives. Because unless he is Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. It's only by getting to know God better that we can keep sight of who we, who we really are in relation to him and truly appreciate all that he has done for us. Such increasing knowledge keeps us humble keeps us grateful and willing servants, which is in reality the bedrock of faithful, fruitful discipleship. It also leads us to gaining the second type of knowledge that Paul speaks of here in verse 18, which is knowing the hope to which all who are in Christ have been called. Knowing the hope to which all who are in Christ have been called. There in Paul talks about the eyes of the heart being enlightened the meaning of which can easily escape us. So let me attempt to explain. In the scriptural sense, the heart is the center of one's being. You could say it defines them. For example, when the prophet Samuel was sent by God to anoint David, who would succeed Saul as king of Israel, while Samuel was concentrating on the physical attributes of David's older brothers, God told him, the Lord does not look at the things people look at, People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And even now, we still have this concept because if someone is is a good-natured, well-meaning person, we might describe them as being kind-hearted or having a good or warm heart. Also, if someone changes their mind about something, we might say that they have had a change of heart. 
Paul therefore makes the point that the hope he speaks of here should be central to who we are as believers. That hope should define us. The eyes of the heart that he speaks of are, simp are, are simply our inner eyes, which need to be opened or enlightened, as Paul puts it, before we can grasp God's truth, which is crucial if we are to know the hope to which all who are in Christ have been called. Now, our understanding of the word hope means that there is an element of, of uncertainty in something. For example, when sitting exams, we may say, oh, I hope I pass them. Or when applying for a job, we may say, I hope I get it. And that uncertainty is based upon the reality that we or other people are prone to failure, and therefore we may not get what we hoped for. But hope in the biblical sense has no such uncertainty attached. And that is because it is based upon the infallibility of God. It is, therefore, a confident expectation that his promises to us will be fulfilled without exception. But what is the hope that Paul speaks of here, you may ask? What is it that all who are in Christ have been called to? Well, simply put, it is the assurance of the blessings of salvation through faith in Christ. Things such as the complete forgiveness of our sins. They are removed from us as far as the east is from the west, as Psalm 103 puts it. This is also known as justification, the complete eradication of our sinful past and a new start in life before God, or being born again, as Jesus put it. Part and parcel of this, of that is a, is a new direction in life, wherein we know we love obey and serve Christ instead of our sinful selves. This means that by turning our backs on our old sinful way of life, we are spared having to live with the consequences of it. Often, when we speak about being saved, we only think of it in the eternal sense. But in reality, we are also saved from our sinful selves and the consequences of such a lifestyle. The examples of which are clear to see in our world today. Therefore, why is it is true that Christ does accept us as we are when we come before him seeking forgiveness? It is also true that he does not leave us as we are. This is because he calls us to a new life in him. So if we believe that salvation is merely a matter of reciting a prayer and then continuing on with our lives as they were beforehand, then we will not know the hope spoken of here. Knowing the hope to which all in Christ have been called leads naturally to the next knowledge Paul speaks of here, which is knowing the glory of God's inheritance. Paul refers to this in verse 18. And in doing so, he shifts our focus from this life to eternity and the riches of salvation which will be received by all who die in Christ. The knowledge of this glorious inheritance gives us an over-the-horizon perspective which helps us deal with the disappointments and hardships of life. It is the light at the end of the tunnel. It is the bright morning star that we see in the night sky which signals that the night is ending and the day is beginning. It is, a, it is, in short, it is the knowledge that the best is yet to come. And Paul uses his words carefully, and by talking about an inheritance, he reminds us as believers of our personal relationship with God. He is our Father. And this is something he has promised to us as children. And the importance of this filial relationship can easily be lost on us, but in essence, it reminds us that God is not some remote, uninterested, grouchy deity who only seeks to find fault with us and who we must try to constantly appease. He is, rather, the best of all fathers. His love for us, patience with us, and generosity towards us completely eclipses that of any human father. He is Almighty God, but by grace through faith in Christ, he is our Father, and as his children we are heirs 
to a glorious inheritance. Exactly what this inheritance will be like is, quite simply, beyond our ability to imagine. But we are given snippets of information on it in Scripture, such as Philippians 3, 20-21, which says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies, so they will be like his glorious body. In Revelation 21, verses 2 to 4, which says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Or mourning. Or crying. Or pain. For the old order of things. Has passed away. In my previous life as a soldier. When I, was in, when I was on operational tours overseas, the one thing that kept me going when things were hard was the knowledge that one day, if God willed it, I would return home to those whom I loved and missed. The knowledge of that helped me through the hardest of times and in a similar but far, far greater way. We know that this life is temporary and one day it will end and if we are in Christ, we will return home to the one who loves us more than we can imagine. But of course, as humans, we are prone to doubt. Which is why the fourth and final thing, or knowledge that Paul speaks of here is so important. And that is knowing the greatness of God's power. Which Paul speaks about in verses 19 to 23. Therein Paul reminds us that the power which raised Christ to life and ascended him to heaven where he is now seated at the right hand of God is the same power at work in, all, in and through all who are in Christ. It is that power which transforms the status of all who seek salvation in Christ's name from that of a sinner to that of a saint before God. It is that power by the inner presence of the Holy Spirit which in each believer that enables them to grow in the knowledge of and love for God. It is that power which enables them to be changed from someone who lives for themselves to become someone who lives for Christ. It is that power which makes the blessings of salvation, the hope to which we are called, a reality. It is that power which guarantees the glorious inheritance that God gives to all his children. As Paul reminds us here in these verses, it is a power that has no equal in all of creation. It is also a power which, like God who wields it, is eternal. It cannot, it does not, and cannot wane. You know, there are people who profess faith in Christ but yet who do not believe in the physical resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. But such people are forgetting the importance of the resurrection to Christianity. As Paul put it himself, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ did not raise, arise from the grave, then we worship a dead person who is incapable of anything. But Christ is not dead. 
He rose from the grave and ascended into heaven where at the right hand of God the Father he reigns supreme. There is nothing in all of creation that is not subject to him. And such is his power. If all the forces of humanity and creation were, combi- were able to combine, they wouldn't even come close. It's like comparing a flea with an elephant. There simply is no comparison. That is the power which provides salvation for all who repent and seek forgiveness in Christ's name. That is the power which keeps all who have been redeemed until the day Christ returns in triumph. So it is the knowledge of this power that can keep all who are in Christ both humble and competent. Humble because they know that their salvation from start to finish is a work of God's grace and confident because they know that he cannot fail. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest upon you and abide with you this day and forevermore. Amen.